His palms are sweaty, knees deep, arms are heavy. <laughs> Vomit on the sweater already. Mom's spaghetti. spaghetti. Hey, nervous. Oh, damn. That was too short, dude. Told you we need a full freestyle segment. Yeah, because I didn't buy it. I'm a, <laughs> I'm a cheap, cheap bastard. Ass. Jesus Christ. I'm a cheap bass. <laughs> that was a great intro. Wow. That was. That this is going to be our good. number one episode. I already <laughs> yeah. feel it. We crushed that. Good job. Yeah. Good one. <laughs> Hopefully, we'll have a more formal intro <laughs> in the near future. But Cough season. That'll Jesus have to Christ. do for now. Um, anyway, welcome to another episode of Hybrid Unlimited. I believe this is episode number four. I am Steffi Cohen, and with me we have Hayden Bo and Alex Uslar and Molly Galbraith and Casey Sassett. Thank you guys for coming. Thanks for Welcome. having us. We're yeah. excited awesome. to be here. Yeah, we're excited to. Uh, I think you are. You guys are the second people that we have as guests in the podcast. Nice right. second couple. Yeah. We're yeah, just we doing couples. Yeah. <laughs> Megan Ryan. Yeah, I, I, I notice a, a common trend between people that have that are couples that run businesses together. You guys just said that you. You understand what each of you guys do, but you don't overlap a ton. Yeah. I think that's actually kind of important sometimes, too. Like, a lot of times I'll uh, run into couples or people or whatever in business, and it's like, I'm a registered dietitian, I'm a registered dietitian, but what you actually need is maybe somebody that can run the business or somebody that you Mm -hmm. spend a lot of time going back and forth about nuances of the last 10 and 7%, you know. Um, Yeah, you, you see the same case with, so Ryan and Meg... Ryan has a background in economics and finance, uh-huh. and Meg has the more background in like strength training and being a powerlifter and that content creation Con- and yeah, all that. Yeah, exactly. You know, Same for you and I. Yeah, you're economic and finance. I'm physical therapy. Your yeah. background is Molly and so my ba- my master's is in business, but I fell in love with fitness, gosh, like 16 years ago, something like that. And the only reason I went on to get my master's is because I was so close to finishing school, and I was like, I don't want to change my major again. But I knew I wanted to do something in health in and fitness. fitness. And I think those complementary skill sets are so important because within every organization that runs you need someone who knows how to manage people it's like there's a book called the e-myth and they talk about you need a technician um, a manager and an entrepreneur like those roles exist within an organization so the entrepreneur's sales and marketing and drives the business or the organization the technician is the person who understands the thing that you do so if it's a software company they understand software right Mm -hmm. if it's a mechanic they understand cars and then you have the manager so the person who understands operations and managing people and that kind of stuff and so i think you know if you if your skill sets are too aligned or whatever you end up missing one or more of those pieces yeah it's so interesting mark echo talks about pretty much that exact same thing in the book on label except for he calls it swagger brute force and governance governance yeah Yeah, that's it's interesting how like it's sort of the same rules being applied just same concept differently way of saying (laughs) yeah (laughs) the street yeah there you go exactly (laughs) Although we have four pieces in the triangle, because Alex, what are you? I'm all. Alex has all. Everything, Alex baby. In everything. I encompass all of those things. <laughs> oh my god. Except software. You're you're is. being yeah. a goof, but you actually are involved in all of those yeah. different things. <laughs> <laughs> you got like a l- one foot in each area of the yeah. business kind of thing. If we were to count my feet, I probably had like 500 of them. <laughs> <laughs> That's about what I feel at Miller's point. Awesome. So, why don't you guys tell us a little bit about what you guys do? Um, so. You guys have Girls Gone Strong, and you've been in the industry for about 10 years, you said? Yeah, yeah. Right? So I've been in the industry for, I fell in love with fitness almost 16 years ago. With In less than a year, I was training clients online and in person. Um, shortly after that, I started a health and fitness software business with a former partner of mine. So I've had four businesses. So my first one failed. Second one I sold for a small profit. Third one I walked away from, and fourth one was Girls Gone Strong. Um, but in terms of like my kind of fitness career, Fell in love with fitness, was coaching clients online and in person starting in 2005, dabbled in powerlifting and figure competitions, um, ended up after my last figure competition rebounding really badly, gaining a lot of weight, got diagnosed with Hashimoto's, which is autoimmune thyroid disease, PCOS, polycystic ovarian syndrome, and adrenal issues. Um, And so it was like a kind of a tumultuous ride over the next several years. I was used to being like super lean and fit and getting a lot of attention and affirmation from people for the way that my body looked. And then all of a sudden that was like ripped away from me and there was nothing I could do about it because my health was in the toilet. So I was like, well, I'm gonna get really strong. 
Do you relate all that to doing the figure stuff? Is that where it is? So, yeah. So um, what my doctor said is that I'm probably predisposed to getting those things. And so the stress from, you know, hours of cardio, I mean, again, this was 2006, seven and eight when I was eating, I was being told to eat 900 calories a day, do two hours of cardio on top of training sessions. We just didn't have the same information that we have now in terms of how you can do that more easily. Um, so she thought that I was predisposed to it and that the stress from that while also doing an accelerated MBA program and starting a business and stuff is kind of what pushed me over the edge. Um, so yeah. And then I was like, well, I'm going to get really strong again. So I did that for a little while. And then, uh, 2012, it was January 4th, I guess. Um, I found out my dad was sick on a Saturday and he died on a Tuesday, uh, night. And so that kicked off a spiral. I ended up injuring my back two weeks later, left a six year relationship, gained a bunch of weight and, um, just kind of had like a crisis of confidence at that point in time. I had started girls gun strong. I had a brick and mortar gym and I was in pain, had gained weight and just like in a really horrible place in my life. Um, and so at that point I even had people, uh, I had a woman in my community telling people not to come to my gym because they might look like me. I had comments from Jesus. people on the, <laughs> <What> the <hell? laughs> I had comments from people on the internet saying, what happened to you? Why does your body look like that? You don't look the way you used to. This was 2012. And then I actually had a guy in the fitness industry who came to my gym to give, uh, as part of a seminar we were hosting. And he basically was making fun of the way that I looked to my staff. And uh, so it was really tough. And then at that point I was like, you know what? Like, I don't want to do this anymore. I don't want to wrap my self-worth and my confidence and, you know, my abilities as a coach and a trainer into the way that my body looks or the way that it performs, right? Because people are like, don't worry how your body looks. Just focus on what it can do. That's the same shit with a different label. You know what I mean? Because the second that you can't do that anymore, you're like, who am I? Do I even have a place here? You know what I mean? That kind of stuff. You see that all the time with powerlifters. Mm -hmm. As soon as their their career's over, they don't know what to do with themselves or any any sport. Yeah, matter. sports just in general, yeah. yeah. What do you do when the lights turn off and you're no longer the person that you were trying to get it back or whatnot? Yeah. It's probably it's tough psychologically. I see why a lot of famous athletes and stuff go through the hard times afterwards. Yeah, so, so that was 2013, kick-started a six-year journey to getting to a place where I felt good and comfortable. I also happened to meet this guy around mm-hmm. 2013. Actually, we met in 2010. I At was a Selsun Blue <laughs> yeah, uh, photo shoot? That's right. That's exactly what it was. <laughs> I was really just trying to... Yeah. Make sure everybody could see yeah. my hair. And stuff. No, I was his waitress at a bar. I actually didn't even have hair then. You I was still shaving hair. it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's I probably was why I couldn't pick you up right away. Yeah. <laughs> I was his waitress at a bar. He came back the next night to ask me out. I was in a relationship, so I turned him down. A couple of weeks later, he started going to the same gym that I went, and he tried to talk to me for about three years. Yeah, it took Jesus three years. Can you believe that? Yeah. It's a pretty funny story, really. Yeah. You might yeah. want to share it. Yeah, yeah, please. <laughs> well, she doesn't actually, want to, so but now you freaking got I, to. So <laughs> we ain't cutting this I shit out. So I've been lifting weights since I was 15. Been in uh, playing football, playing sports, everything. Went on. Uh, University of uh, Nebraska Westland. Played college football there. So got what done. you're saying is you've never been rejected by a female before. <laughs> <laughs> Close. I'm not saying that. <laughs> uh, so so after uh, football, I got in. I went to school to be a nurse. Um, I kind of was like evaluating where I could go. I knew like health and fitness was really interesting to me. I wasn't sure about like doing strength training at like the collegiate level or whatnot. And really uh, working in fitness wasn't the career uh, than that it is today. Like it's really exploded since then. There's a lot more opportunity. So I was kind of looking at it and like trying to carve out what kind of life I wanted and stuff. And I was looking at nursing and I could see that you could get into the hospital right away, make a decent living, kind of pick up and go to different cities if you needed to move really quick. And then like the education that came after it, if you wanted to be an NP or if you wanted to be a nurse anesthetist or whatever, it was really easy to go change your career without actually changing your career, right? You just get some more education. So I went on, uh, I was working as a nurse. Uh, I was working in like eating disorders and psychiatric nursing and stuff. And then uh, my little brother had a stroke. Uh, He was playing college football um, in Nebraska. I came home to see uh, my family and spend a little time with my brother. It was really difficult time. Um, I had a friend out in Kentucky that was living out there that I had known when I was a kid. Uh, he called, he heard about my brother. He's like, Hey, why don't you come out here and visit? Uh, I came out to Kentucky. I was there for like 
a week, just get my mind off of everything. And this really strange opportunity for me to buy a semi load of mattresses happen. <laughs> and I was in this awkward state of mind where I had been a, a, an entrepreneur all through middle school and high school. Half of the rules on eBay are created because I was finding loopholes in ways that you could <laughs> sell stuff on eBay way back in the day. And so I was like, I, I was kind of looking at all these mattresses and I'm like, oh, I can make money off of these. I can figure this out. So I bought this semi load of mattresses, uh, put an ad in the paper, uh, flipped all the mattresses, uh, decided to buy a second uh, uh, trailer of mattresses, ended up uh, opening up a store across the street from the largest mattress company in uh, Kentucky and uh, said, all right, I'm moving to Kentucky and I'm going to try and make this into I'm gonna a thing. I'm going to be a mattress salesman. I think whatever was going on with uh, the situation with my brother or whatever just kind of gave me the confidence to be like, you know, this isn't what I want to do. I want to be an entrepreneur or whatnot. So I moved to Kentucky and uh, this I knew one person there and uh, he's like, why don't we go out to the bar or whatnot? And I was like, no, that's not really my thing. I like to lift, stay in shape, play basketball, that sort of thing. He kept asking me. So I was like, all right, I'll go out with you. And uh, so he's don't like, don't forget gonna... he was actually setting you up on a that's date. That's true. He was yeah. setting me up on a date. <laughs> and so I, I walk into the place and right when I open the door, I see Molly and she's working. She's a waitress there. And I'm like, I'm, I'm like, I hope I get to sit in her section. <laughs> and so then we get sat down and I sit in her section. And uh, she's kind of giving me a hard time. She's my waitress. She's making fun of me. It was <laughs> he was wearing oh. a mock turtleneck. Okay. okay. So well, tell the story now. Well, it's a t- it's a <laughs> There's, so a, there's a the blizzard going on, now. okay? There's a blizzard. I'm just super hung up on the fact that you sold mattresses at the newspaper. Craigslist. Is this cra- oh, really yeah. years ago? Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> 2000, <laughs> 2009. <laughs> about newspaper? No, 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 no. no, no. Put, put ad in the paper. Uh, put put, the post paper. it on Craigslist. Okay, Craigslist. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah okay. just working the online. Back <laughs> then, all it was I the this forms was and the stuff. the internet. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, wait. Yeah. What year is this? Yeah, yeah. What year is this? But where were we? Oh, yeah. The blizzard, right? So there's a blizzard going on and they're like canceling school and everything. So I'm, you know, I just put He's on all like my overall, like bib overall, I put on snow all gear. my winter gear. Yeah. I don't like care what I look like. I'm stuff. like, I'm so, going to go dude, in there. Bet if you had that and that hair, she would have thought you were hot. <laughs> I know. Bald. And I didn't have the hair. <laughs> that was didn't the have problem. didn't have the hair. Or else she would be like, ooh, that <laughs> turtleneck. Ah. <laughs> so, yeah. So I'd be like, you want another beer? You're looking awful toasty in your turtleneck, you know, and things like that. Okay. It was a mock. It wasn't it's, like a full yeah. turtleneck. And he was like, he was like, well, you know, why are you making fun of me? And I was like, have you seen what you're wearing? And he's like, it's ski gear. And I was like, have you been skiing? And he's like, well, no. And I'm like, all right then. And uh, yeah, so he came back the next night to ask me out. Oh, I yeah, said yeah. No. So we left and the guy I was with was like, let's go out again tomorrow or whatnot. And I was like, no, I'm not going. He asked again. I'm like, I'll tell you what, I'm going back with you if I can go to that exact same bar. I'm going to ask that waitress out. So yeah. I went back the next night, tapped on her shoulder. She turned around and act like I didn't tap on her shoulder. Uh, and then uh, basically, uh, I, I, what I say to you? I told you that uh, I you thought you were really sexy. Yeah, he said, I, I, think he said I thought you were really sexy and I just, I just wanted to ask you out. And I'm like, okay, well, I, that's really, or I said, oh, I have a boyfriend and I kind of blew him off. And then I started to feel bad. So I went back up to him later and was like, hey, I'm flattered, but I do have a boyfriend. And um, yeah. So, I mean, the rest of the story, there's a bunch of other stuff. His roommate started training at my gym and was like, there's a whole bunch of other stuff going on. But three years later, after he kept trying to talk to me <laughs> at the gym, I ended up single and uh, he convinced me to go to his mattress store and try out and try out a pillow. <laughs> I know, like, right? This, by this time, we'd become a sleep specialty shop. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> yes, yes, that is true. A sleep specialty shop. Way, really, really nice. And so he convinced me to come into a store. I guess he thought if he could get me into his store, then I might be a little bit more interested. And by that time, I was like, this guy's actually kind of cute. He had hair, and uh-huh. I was really into that, and I thought he was kind of cute, but I kept trying to... I got trying my Selsun to- Blue sponsorship by that. <laughs> <laughs> and so I was like, this guy's cute, so I kept being like, I'm hungry. He didn't take the bait. <laughs> I'm hungry. He didn't take the bait, and in his mind, he's thinking, like, I already asked you out. You're going to have to ask me out. So I had to ask him out. I asked him if he wanted to go get something to eat, and within six weeks, we were uh, saying I love you and living together, and uh, the rest is... It, it, well, it's uh, kind of interesting, history. though, because to go back on what we where this whole thing started or, or whatnot, uh, right around that time, I basically got the, the stores had grown to four mattress stores, and I had just hired somebody to run the stores. And I was kind of like working my way out of the store. And so here I meet Molly and uh, 
I don't I don't even have Facebook at this point. I'm like I'm not online or anything like that. And I I noticed that uh, all these people are following you on Facebook. Isn't that what happened? And I cornered you at the gym. I'm like, hey, what's going on with all this? These people following yeah. you on Facebook. Yeah. And I said, well, I don't know. I've just been putting information on Facebook and just kind of sharing things that I've learned and you know talking about my gym and putting videos of myself lifting online and stuff. And people just kind of follow me. And I have this thing called Girls Gone Strong. And at that time, I think we had maybe. 50,000 fans at the time. they were. What year was this? This was 2013. So Girls Gone Strong started in 2011. Started with seven women who all came from different areas of health and fitness. Sorry, can you explain what Girls Gone Strong is? Yeah, absolutely. So what Girls Gone Strong is today is a a health and fitness movement that inspires women to improve their strength and confidence from the inside out. And we do that um, as an education company that provides evidence-based interdisciplinary women-specific health and fitness information to women and to health and fitness professionals who work with women. So we do that through free articles, free courses, videos, um, training programs, certifications for health and fitness professionals. We have one that covers coaching, psychology, anatomy and physiology, exercise, rest recovery and programming across an adult woman's lifespan so we get into body image disordered eating menstrual cycle menopause all those types of topics and then we have a pre and postnatal coaching certification that covers those same topics coaching psychology anatomy and physiology exercise rest recovery postpartum recovery uh, for women who are pregnant postpartum so that is in a nutshell what we do is we're an education company Mm -hmm. and um, but what it started as in 2011 was literally it started with a tweet started with one woman saying hey uh, it'd be really fun if a bunch of us could all get together and work out sometime and a few of us were going to support um, a woman at her powerlifting meet so I sent an email to like 10 or 15 women and said hey couple of us are going to be in Cincinnati and if anybody wants to come like you know show on up and again this is 2011 which is not that long ago but Mm -hmm. for the most part there you walk into a weight room of a gym and you might be one of maybe one or two other women in the in the weight room so it was feeling kind of lonely you know and we were we were all kind of cropping up doing our own little things online I sent that email seven women showed up and we were like I want to help more women strength train. I want to help more women strength train. I want to help more women strength train. We all kind of had this mission. So we didn't really know what it was going to be, but we knew there was this great chemistry between us and that we didn't want it to die. So we started our Facebook page and, uh, cause that which, was, which at the point was pretty new. It was a new idea. Mm-hmm. Like social media was just getting really going and there wasn't really a place on social media where whim- well, women and strength was being celebrated. Mm-hmm. The way that- so yep. there were several women involved, but, um, the ownership, like, how did you guys divide owner- ownership at that yeah, point? Yeah, so, so everything was equal at that point. And over the years, each of the women kind of stepped away to do their own thing. And, you know, it takes a while for an organization to start giving back. And every, these people are busy gym owners and, you know, wives and partners and mothers yeah, and trainers. Yeah, it wasn't trainers a business and at that point. Just sharing information, you know, mm-hmm. and not really tr- asking for anything in exchange. It wasn't a, transac- a transactional thing. It was just Yeah, so the, f- the first day we started our Facebook page, we had like a thousand likes or whatever, which you know i mean obviously i know i know how many uh, how many likes and followers you guys have have and get on stuff but that was like a really big deal it's like oh this might be a thing and like the first day we launched our website we had 17,000 people come to it and all the guys in the fitness industry were really supportive as well they were like this is so awesome we're so excited to see um women doing this because at that point there wasn't very much women specific information Mm -hmm. and there still um, isn't yeah, <laughs> right. <Yeah. laughs> and uh, and there are some things that aren't that different. And there are a lot of things that are very different, you know. Mm-hmm. And so there, there wasn't a lot of women specific stuff. And the stuff that was available wasn't really, there wasn't much by women, which that's fine. Men can, you know, educate on women's stuff, you know, quite well. But people were hungry for something by women, for women, about women. Um, and so it just kind of started started taking off at that point. So, and it, over time, so it started as like, we want more women to strength train. And over time it's evolved into an education company that covers everything related to women's health. So was strength- that at the same time that you got involved, Casey? Yeah, so uh, what was that? 2000- 2013 is when we started dating. Yeah, yeah okay. so we started dating and it was kind of, it, it wasn't a business. It was it was uh, basically free information online at that point, and I just started asking her questions. I was like, "Well, how are you monetizing this? How is this a thing? What it, what is the goals of it?" Mm-hmm. And as I learned more and more, I was like, "Oh, let's let's go at this. You, let's let's yeah. sell your gym and let's do this." Yeah, and oh, yeah. So around that time, started putting in the steps to sell part of your gym. Mm-hmm. And then uh, we kind of went in full speed ahead as business partners and 
yeah. been doing it since then. Yeah. So the beginning of 2014 is when we were like, okay, we think we can make this work. I sold my interest in my gym to my former business partner and we released our first, uh, first like strength training program to the world in April of 2014 sold in 40 countries. I mean, people were and, begging for yeah, it. In cool. five days or something. Yeah. And it's really, you know, it happened in five days, but it happened from all the work done for years and years and years of just giving and giving and giving. By the time we actually offered a product, yeah, people they were, were begging us yeah, to, begging to, to release our something. Mm-hmm. So it's strength training products, or sorry, strength training and uh, courses. Like so, that, yeah, those so, are so the we two. cover, we, cover um, we have strength training programs. So yep. we've got uh, hypertrophy, strength, fat for loss. Women, yeah. For women, specifically. Mm-hmm. Um, for people who are maybe new to the gym or coming back after time off, we have pre and postnatal programs. So yep. for women who are trying to conceive pregnant and postpartum, we've yep. got strength training and nutrition. And then we do coaching. So you can work with... Um, work with a, a girls gone strong coach actually through girls gone strong and then we certify health and fitness professionals that's amazing hmm. what are um some of the differences between male and female when it comes to training ah, i love this question so you know i think that so often people focus on the anatomical and physiological yeah. changes and that is certainly important there are definitely considerations um that need to be taken between males and females in that way. But I think what a lot of people are missing are the psychological considerations, the struggles with body image, the struggles with disordered eating, the struggles with feeling like we're not good enough, the struggles with comparing ourselves to other women. Um, so 80% of women in the U.S. and 80, I'm sorry, 81% of women in the U.S. and 80% of women in Canada report being dissatisfied with their bodies. 85% of women um, report opting out of important life events because they don't like the way their body looks. So they are not uh, going to special events. They're not going to the beach with their kids. They're refusing to be in pictures and videos with their children. They're literally like opting out of their own life because they don't feel they look good enough to. And it's trickling down to young girls. So mm-hmm. 79% of young girls report also opting out of life events because they don't wow. want to. They're not raising their hand in class. They're not trying out for the sports team. They're not running for class president. They're not participating in the school play so you can imagine over time how opting out of those things compounds and really prevents them from being able to have the same opportunities and gain the same skills and the same experiences um, as their you know male counterparts because of this conditioning that we receive that we're supposed to look a certain way and if we you know if we don't look good enough to then you know, then we're not worthy enough um, in terms of disordered eating. And I think it was a 2006 large scale survey of over 4,000 people from the University of South Carolina. 75% of the women reported engaging in disordered eating habits and behaviors. And uh, disordered eating is the greatest predictor of developing an eating disorder, which is the deadliest of all mental illnesses. So those things are um, really difficult. A lot of women struggle with feeling like, um, their body doesn't belong to them, like their body is there for the pleasure and service of others, which I know is a really strange one. But when I talk to and lecture on this to other health and fitness professionals, I'm like, how many of you all have clients who say that they feel guilty coming to the gym because they don't want to take the time for themselves and every hand comes up? How many of you have clients who say that um, they feel like, you know, they're coming to the gym because like the analogy, right? Um, terms of putting the oxygen mask on have you all heard the analogy like you have to put your oxygen mask on first before you put the others so you have to take care of yourself so that you can take care of others Mm -hmm. so women are told like you have to take care of yourself so that you can take care of others why don't they just take care of themselves because they're worthy of self-care like you're never like i'm gonna get a bench press session in because it makes me a better partner you know what i mean like (laughs) i'm doing it for you (laughs) i'm doing it for you but seriously like we tell women like take care of yourself so that you can be in service of others um in terms of things like unpaid domestic labor for example in the u.s i think women in developed countries women do twice the unpaid domestic labor of men in developing countries it's like three times so women do significantly more stuff around the house have less time for themselves overall so there are all of these issues caring for ailing family members Mm -hmm. caring for kids and it's not like it's um Like oftentimes it's just how it's always been. So it's not like, hey, your partner sucks and he's lazy and he's not going to help you with anything. It's just a lack of awareness because of the way things happen. So when it comes to coaching women, if you if you're having someone who's like struggling to be consistent, for example, it's not because she's lazy. You know, it's not because she doesn't want it. It's not because of, um, you know, she doesn't like care about it enough. It's like, hey, there are other things that might be going on in her life that Mm -hmm. you need to be thinking about. So those are some of the kind of coaching and psychological in terms of anatomical and physiological. Um, 
you know, there we do a lot of stuff with like pregnancy and postpartum. So uh, 85% of women will have a baby at their, some point in their life and 67 to 75% of people who hire a coach or trainer are women. So yeah, if you're, that's the big one. Yeah. So if you're, if you're a coach or trainer, you know, a lot of people get into it thinking they're going to train like Work only with elite athletes. Yeah. Elite <laughs> athletes or power lifters or whatever. Mm-hmm. And for the most part, people who hire a coach or trainer are general population women and most of them will have a baby at some point in their life. So there's really important things to think about. Um, 60, let's see, 48 to 67% of women uh, leak urine by week 30 of their pregnancy. Um, 30% of women are still having painful sex a year postpartum. So they're experiencing painful sex could also be related to like um, to pelvic pain or other things that they're experiencing. Uh, up to 19% of women will have surgery for pelvic organ prolapse or incontinence at some point in their life. How much? One in five. Up to 19% wow. of women are having surgery and 30% of them have to have multiple surgeries. So these are things that if you know about them, you're aware of them, you can have a conversation about them, you can refer them out to yeah. somebody like a pelvic and, health physiotherapist. And a lot of times I keep, I'll hear conversation about scope of practice and stuff like that, but I think you know, being on the front lines, working with our clients day to day, seeing them before maybe the medical team gets to actually see them, knowing, being able to see something and knowing how to refer out, establishing that referral network. Yeah. Really I mean, important. there are things that are outside of the scope of practice of a coach, but if you don't understand what's happening and who to refer them to, and you don't have that relationship with them, then you don't know your client probably has no idea what's going on. So knowing who to refer her to and helping her feel safe and comfortable in doing that, I think is really important. Yeah. Starting uh, that conversation in the end of the day, physicians only get seven minutes with their patients. So oh. sometimes we as coaches and even as PTs, phys- physical therapists, we get um, more information because mm-hmm. we, we get more time with them, right? So yeah, absolutely, and, and it's definitely th- a valuable conversation to have. These things: incontinence, pelvic organ prolapse, pelvic pain, painful sex. All of these things. Like, think about it. Your client just had a baby. Her whole life just got flipped upside down. She's probably feeling maybe a little bit disconnected from her partner. She feels like her body doesn't belong to her. She might be breastfeeding. She might be struggling to recover from a C-section, and then she tries to, you know. To, like get back to her relationship with her partner and have sex and then it's painful you know what I mean like it's just like there's so many other things that can be going on then she thinks there's something wrong with her body you know there's just like there's so much deep stuff that can be going on and those things can often be successfully treated or mitigated or even prevented sometimes with with good pelvic health physiotherapy so there mm-hmm. are lots of things that can be done if health and fitness professionals are aware of them so I think it's just a lot deeper um than most coaches are willing to recognize. Again, you get into fitness and you're like, it's all about sets and reps and the best program. (laughs) And like, cool, sets and reps and a great program are important. Behavior modification. Yeah, if you know how to actually help people. (laughs) Mm -hmm. If you know how to actually help people um, do the, like make the changes in their lives to actually adopt the program. Do you understand how to have the conversation with them? Do you understand how to help them fit this into your, into their life? Do you understand how to help them um, actually build the skills and habits to, you know, to, to follow your program versus like you can have the best program ever on paper, but if you're a client, if you can't get your client to do it, then mm-hmm. I'm interested uh, to, uh, to learn how you got to that point of offering the sort of all that background stuff and this, this, the psychological approach, it, because you said you started with just releasing a training program, right? Mm-hmm. So was it that y- you released the training program and feedback you were getting was, were a lot of these problems or how did you get from A to B? Yeah. So that's, that was definitely part of it. And even in our strength training programs, we were including some information about that. We mm-hmm. were trying to include different ways to make the program more approachable for people. Yeah, like, like our coaching, no yeah, walking through our coaching, through our coaching program. Yeah. So, so shortly after we released the program, we released our girls gun strong coaching, which was a, is nutrition training and kind of mindset. So essentially helping women feel more comfortable and basically heal their relationship with their bodies within our scope of practice. They're are some really simple and powerful things that coaches can do to do that so we take like a three-pronged approach with our coaching and we just had so many women giving us feedback saying like you know I signed up because I wanted to get my first pull up but like I never imagined that I would feel comfortable enough to you know get to get up and walk across the beach to get in the water with my kids you know or I never um never imagined that I would feel so good and free. You know, I would never imagine that like this is the first summer I've worn shorts because I finally feel good about the way that I look. So we started seeing how powerful that side of things was and how so 
few people were offering that side. Um, and also we have a fantastic mentor and advisor and a guy named Dr. John Berardi of Precision Nutrition, who's a close uh, yeah. friend, basically like family of ours. And he's been kind of advising um, Girls Gone Strong for five or six years now. And I mean, Precision Nutrition is leading the way in terms of behavior modification. And change psychology. Change psychology. Brought it to the industry, really. Mm -hmm. But there's the other aspect of it that it, it's kind of like your own personal journey as well. Like you always say you were chasing a number. Like it was first it was on the scale. Mm -hmm. Then it was like, how much can I deadlift? And like when you actually get to that number, it's not, it, enough. It's not enough. Like there's still something else that you're chasing. It's just... Yeah, it's if, internal. Or... If you are chasing it to feel worthy and valuable, right? right? Yeah. So I was like, okay, when I lose 15 pounds, when I get a six pack, when I wear a size six, when I deadlift, you know, 315 pounds or whatever, um, then I'm going to feel really good about myself. I'm going to feel like I've got a place in this industry. I'm going to feel like I'm a good coach. And um, and every time I got there, it was like, well, I mean, now I got to now I got to deadlift 355, you know, and like, <laughs> or now I got to, which is awesome. You know, yeah, and those are great goals. They're, they're, it's like what, what happens when the light turn off what happens when you get back pain yeah. what happens mm -hmm. when you have a rebound after a figure competition and you can't compete again mm -hmm. and now you have to go make your way through life as a as a person who's not carrying around the water jug in the gym and yeah. uh and so you know, super and i started and talking about this openly like to my knowledge I'm, i don't i don't think i was the first by any stretch of the imagination but to my knowledge i was one of the um first women in the fitness industry talking about my body image struggles posting pictures of my cellulite posting pictures of my stretch marks yeah. back in like 2012 um before and, it was trendy yeah, it yeah. wasn't it wasn't really there it wasn't, wasn't like all the instagram mm -hmm. models and all the stuff it was there was facebook i think instagram was was even a thing yet uh, yeah it just started right. around just then started. and just so started. molly she, you wrote it's hard out here for a fit chick and it crashed the website yeah <laughs> I, so i did a couple different things i wrote an article called it's hard out here for a fit chick about how even health and fitness professionals struggle to be consistent we struggle with feeling good in our body we struggle with that kind of stuff then i did a thing called a love your body challenge and it was basically just like um, hey, I'm going to take people through a 28 day kind of mindset program, like different reasons to love your body um, that don't necessarily have anything to do with the way that it looks. And then about a year and a half after that, I posted a post on my Facebook page, January 1st, 2016. Oh, yeah. It went mega viral. It ended up reaching 464 million people worldwide. What? <laughs> Wait, like Little Wayne sharing it. Yeah, it was like Little Wayne, well, Ashton it? Kutcher. I want to look Whoa. it up. <laughs> hey, Little Wayne's just a couple doors down. You should go say hi. Oh, really? Hi. <laughs> <laughs> what was it? I want to so look it up. So it's called, if you, if you Google, this is my body, Molly Galbraith, Facebook, it should come up. So how do you spell your last name? G-A-L-B-R-A-I-T-H. So basically it was like end of December, 2015, we were in Costa Rica and I was walking down the beach and I was just like, you know, thinking about like, oh, get a picture or whatever for social media. And I was like, you know what? Like, I am so sick of before and after pictures. There is not before and after is not a thing. You know what I mean? Like, it is literally mm -hmm. all just during. Like, mm -hmm. it is all just during for our entire life. So I was like, I just want to get a picture of like, what does my body look like today on a Tuesday when I'm not doing anything special? I'm not prepping for anything. I'm not, you know. And so I asked Casey to take a picture of me and I kind of forgot about it. And a few weeks later, we were at home at his parents' home in Nebraska. And I was like, oh, I haven't posted that picture. I got to post it. So I wrote this story and it was like, this is my body. This is not a before picture. This is not an after picture. This is what my body looks like on a random Tuesday in December of 2015. Like this body has been abused with late nights and, um, you know, whatever. I can't even remember what all I said, like exercise, over exercise and not enough sleep. And, um, I talked about like my back pain and my Hashimoto's and all this kind of stuff. And it basically at the end, I was like, what's the thing? Why did, why, did, why does this matter? Like who cares about this? And I was like, Oh shit, it's January 1st. This is the first year in as long as I can remember that I have not made a resolution to change the way that my body looks. Holy cow. And I hadn't even realized it. It literally just hit me. And I was like, that's the thing. And I was like, this is a type of freedom. I did not think I would ever experience. And it feels really good. So I posted it and you know, hit refresh or whatever. And it's like 300 likes. And I'm like, e -e 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 -e. what? You know? <laughs> and, uh, cause at that time I had maybe 20,000 fans or followers or whatever, you know, people who liked my, my business page and I refresh it again. It's like a thousand likes and I'm like, hold on a second. And so I keep refreshing and it's like 2000, 3000. I'm like, what is going on? So it ended up getting, 
I don't know, it reached about 12 million people from my page, but it got picked up on the newswire is what happened. I got interviewed by this woman. She sent it out to a bunch of um, magazines. So like People Magazine interviewed me, The Today Show, um, Ashton Kutcher shared it, Little Wayne, Zoe Deschanel, George Takai, um, Cosmopolitan. So <laughs> Cosmopolitan um, shared it. I mean, it was just like all over the place. And so my friend works for some company that helps people measure impressions. And so he sent me a thing. He's like, I ran the numbers on this. He's like, this has reached 464 million people. That's worldwide. nuts. Um, your, your Facebook page has 93,000 people following it. Mm-hmm. These are the f- real Facebook. Oh, jeez. Yeah, Go Girls <laughs> Gone Strong. Go Girls Gone Strong. I think Let's that's, see. I don't know what yeah, it is, but it's a lot more than that. Yeah, it's like Facebook, yeah, it's like with, Instagram. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Instead of Jerry Wine, that's something you talked about. I feel like that's something that's such an oversight, Jesus, especially with how saturated people coaching has become, that the mental aspect of it is really everything. When it comes to females, I coach a lot of females one-on-one and ma- males as well. They both need it. But it's like you can only put so many numbers in a spreadsheet. That's Anyone will totally. progress with that. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? But having the mental aspect and the understanding is so big and it's, it's such an oversight with so many of online coaches in-person coaches and it's 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 just it's sad to see and not a lot of people don't realize the value of that mm-hmm. and I, I mean i think i love average, your guys's presentation by the way thank you really the good. average um i think woman goes on at least five diets in her life and i think 80 percent of 10 year olds feel like they're fat and it's just like you know there's so much um so many women are struggling with that and it literally occupies their mind so much that they can't even they don't even have the the time and capacity to think about other things, you know? So, um, and a lot of times my, my, uh, our head coach, Jen Comas and I talk about how sometimes we feel like we're cleaning up the carnage a little bit of women who have been through the grinder of coaches who don't care about them, who are willing to crash diet them, who send them the 900 calorie meal plan. I have a post that I've made on Instagram a few times and it's like six almonds is not a snack like six almonds is enough almonds to piss me off and make me want more <laughs> almonds because literally that's the kind of meal plan that we would get from coaches Dude, well and you, you would think that that's been eradicated by now you but i literally just saw and i just pulled it up to so i can read you guys a little bit about it but uh did you guys hear about beyonce's 22 day diet no i was reading it popped up on my like news feed on my phone beyonce's so, yeah mm. is it to prepare for 22 days nutrition it's called and it's like her new uh nutrition program um, and it's based around her other nutrition program that's called 44 Days Pre Coachella Crash Diet. So you cut that's out carbs. Cr- it's called the Pre Coachella Crash Diet. Yeah. So he, here, here it out. Oof. So it cuts out carbs, sugar, dairy, meat, fish, and alcohol. <laughs> so she eats veggies. Is that it? <laughs> so you <coughs> you don't you eat you drink water. <laughs> Cuts it out ice too, cubes, yeah, right. <laughs> so it presents a calorie count for a serving of foods, but it doesn't give you guidance on how many servings or meals to eat. If you focus on eating clean, plant-based meals, you will notice that you feel satisfied and nourished <sighs> after your meals, and your health will likely follow. Yeah, and I, I mean, who know. knows if that's actually like I don't, you know, I don't, I don't know if her team released that or whatever. But that's the kind of stuff that you see, or like the magazines that I used to buy. Like it would be like you know, one peach for a snack or for, you know what I mean? For like three egg whites and I, it, yeah, it was, it was rough. And so, but I did it cause that's what I thought that I had to do to get the body, you know, that I wanted that I thought would make me happy. And so, um, yeah, so there's just, it, there's been a definitely a big evolution for us in Girls Gone Strong from like even telling women to strength train. We don't tell women to strength train anymore. We talk about how awesome it is. We talk about the benefits of it. We show them what's possible for their bodies, but it's like, hey, it's on you. You get to choose what you want. You know what I mean? Because we used to be like that, you know, again, eight or nine years ago, like making fun of other modalities of exercise. And it's like, that is so unhelpful. Mm-hmm. That yeah. is so unhelpful when most people already feel intimidated by the gym or they're unsure of what to do or they, you know what I mean? I've, I've had people in my life be like, they run or whatever. And they're like, I know you don't want to hear this, but I run. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I did that to you six years ago or eight years ago that I made you feel like running running is something you should be ashamed of or embarrassed about. You know what I mean? It's just like, so it's just evolution. Like, you know, I feel like I've reached a stage of maturity or whatever. And kind of my approach to coaching. 10 years from now, you'll be like, what was I thinking? Yeah, exactly. 10 years from now, look look back at now and be like, oh, that's embarrassing. But yeah, so it's just You listen to his podcast and be like, oh, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, so it's just been... uh, I think a natural evolution of getting feedback from people, finding what works, paying attention to what resonates. I mean, the stuff related to body image and 
disordered eating and things like that has always resonated with our community. Um, and it, the change psychology stuff is we found to be most helpful for people long term because that's the thing we're not selling a crash diet or a quick fix sure. or a yeah. you know a meal plan that they're going to follow and then that was the thing I had followed so many meal plans I remember I was like standing in the grocery store I was 24 years old and I didn't have a meal plan for the first time and I was like what do I buy? I literally did <laughs> not have the skills or knowledge to know like I was like do I buy chicken? Okay, chicken's probably good, right? Okay, so chicken breasts. I think that, yeah, chicken breasts are white meat. Okay, so then what about thighs? Can I buy thighs? Then, like, okay, no, you know, uh, can I marinate them? Is that allowed? And it's like, holy cow. I'm literally asking if I can marinate my chicken, you know? So it just, like, yeah. gets people to focus on the wrong things instead of being able to pull back and be like, hey, you know, do I still want to be, like, in the gym 20 years from now, 30 years from now? I was talking to um, somebody the other day, and they were asking like one of the things that I was most proud of. And I'm like, you know, I'm not the strongest. I'm not the leanest. I'm not the most powerful. I'm, you know, but I'm pretty freaking proud that I'm 16 years. I've been in the gym lifting weights consistently. Like I'm still pretty strong. I'm still pretty capable. I kept up in a workout with you all today, which was awesome. <laughs> um, and like, that's something to be, that's something to be really proud of. And I want to be in the gym 16 years from now and 30 years from now and 40 years from now. And taking this kind of approach is going to allow me to do it without burning out, mm -hmm. running myself into the ground, feeling horrible. Mm -hmm. Just making it part of your, of your lifestyle. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Habits. When you see uh, girls now uh, who want to pursue bikini or fitness or things like that, having, you know, the negative personal experience that you had. Do you try to caution them against it or do you direct them to a route that you think's better? You know, is there I love actually, this question. You know, yeah, we create we create information and content that we can share with them for yeah. a lot of uh, women that are, are like navigating this decision or just got done with it, you know, competing or whatnot. Mm -hmm. We've so, created a lot of our content over the years around it. I mean, a couple of things. One, autonomy is one of my highest values. So like you're in charge of you, I'm in charge of me. Like I, th I think that's really important Two, I think people have to go through their own experience. So for me, like I wrote um, some articles a couple of years ago called uh, Extreme Leanness, the Good, the Bad and the Ugly. And I shared three experiences of women who had done figure competitions who had great experiences, loved it, like totally recommend it. Three women who had negative experiences and then two women who had like really dark, like bad, scary experiences. So whenever people ask me about that, I'm just like, hey, there, there are risks to it. Like if you want to do it, I recommend that you work with someone who knows what they're doing, who's not willing to crash diet you, who will give you feedback saying, hey, I don't actually think we can make this show in time. I'm not willing to have you do the things that it would take to get there. Um, but, you know, here's what happened to me afterwards. Like I wouldn't do it again personally from the, my perspective now, but I think it's really important for you to do your own thing. So for me, it's all about informed like yeah. you know letting people choose what they want to do with their life and just hoping to get them the information they need to make the best decision for them because mm -hmm. i think yeah. some people if you told them not to do it they would always wonder right. or they would like, like uh, motivational mm -hmm. interviewing and how it works and stuff like you, you tell somebody mm -hmm. not to do something they might double down on do it you share an sure. experience give them the information let them take the tools that yeah. you know or have the tools to yeah, so like, what would be good themself. about this for you? What would, you know, what would be good about doing it? What would be bad about doing it? What would be good about not doing it? What would be bad about not doing it? And just kind of letting them kind of come to the conclusion themselves with all the information. Because that's the thing. I didn't have all the information. And that's the thing that I find um, most frustrating was that, you know, I didn't, I didn't know what I was getting myself into. I used to fight with my mom. She's like, that can't be healthy. And I'd be like, we should both get our blood drawn and compare them. You know, like I just like was so adamant about like, it's fine. This is way healthier than, you know, and I, I just didn't have enough knowledge. I had such a, I mean, I was two years, three years into my career when I thought I knew everything, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I, um, I was just convinced that it was like the thing to do. So, but what, I think it's, what other articles ha is there? that we've published on that. I know there was the Jen Comis on the Tupperware one. What's yeah. That? Yeah. What was it about? Um, how I gave up Tupperware and got my life back. And she basically <laughs> just talked about how for so many years, everything in her life revolved around the leanness of her body. And she said no to all of these other opportunities. And my things. switch from cardio to strength. Yeah. She what yep. else was there. Mm -hmm. She did. She was doing, she was a 
group fitness instructor was doing five to six hours of cardio a day and um, just and still not seeing the results that she wanted and again it was all trying to achieve this specific aesthetic and leanness and so that one's been really powerful for a lot of people why um training hard no results we had an article why you're training hard and not getting results and again Mm -hmm. it's just women running them into the ground and then adaptation not exhaustion yeah so we've written written about that topic a lot because that's a what a lot of women in our community have been have been doing is just you know, overdoing the cardio for their goals, right? Like, um, not, uh, not doing as much strength training, running themselves into the ground (laughs) and, uh, and, um, then oftentimes not being able to control their eating. Mm -hmm. And so we're doing like the insanity workout plans or like these, these Mm -hmm. really high, you know, like, like, yeah, obsession, like a program do called obsession. Like if your, if your goals are to like, just you know, get a little bit stronger and feel a little bit yeah. better and maybe feel it's a little like more comfortable It's like after three months or whatever, you, you reach the end of it and then you're so exhausted. You're just like, I'm not going to the gym for well, three months and it's everything. super intense, like yeah. P90X. Yeah. Like, sure, yeah, you'll probably get in great shape yeah. if you can survive it for right. you know, 30 days or whatever. Right. But, yeah. but have you ever heard healthy. of it? I don't think I've ever heard of someone who made it all the way through, yeah. like following it as prescribed. Yeah. Even if you do, like it has a shelf life. So you, and so like, what do you when, do? so like yeah, while you're doing it, you're... You're like just sitting there. I can't wait till this is over. I can't wait till this is over. And then then it's over and then you don't work out anymore. (laughs) You're right back where you started. So this is like this cycle of. I did P90X for like two days. You survive it? For two days. (laughs) (laughs) I did P92 or P2X. That's what you did. (laughs) P2X. P2X. (laughs) I just remember the floor being like drenched in sweat. It was in my, when I was living with Tally in Brickle. Yeah. And I had tile floors and the floor was drenched in sweat and I was like slipping, slipping going like, all over <laughs> the place. <laughs> you well, know? there's like Those often <laughs> so much like plyometric stuff and it's like, I mean, I don't know. I haven't done it myself, but it's like, okay, person who hasn't worked out or moved their body consistently in five years, we're going to, you're going to do a hundred jump squats or whatever. And yeah. it's like, what? It's, it's like, insane. that doesn't even make sense, no. you know? So. No, it doesn't. Yeah. What, um... What is your guys' main form of advertisement now that, like, I, I definitely Facebook is not dead, but I think people are migrating outside of Facebook. So mm-hmm. you guys are starting to get more into Instagram. What else do you guys use? Well, I mean, we content market. So, I mean, we write. So people that come to us like to read, and we create lots of free courses, lots of free articles, and uh, we are constantly promoting them on those two platforms that you just mentioned, we actually get a lot of traffic from Facebook. Yeah. Um, and uh, we get a, a, a fair amount from Instagram, but people are finding us through Google as well uh, because we've been publishing now yeah. for That's many articles we have on our website. We have almost 900 articles on you know our website. I mean? wow. Yeah. And, and so we've been publishing for a long time and uh, in that way. And then um, so people will oftentimes uh, take one of our free courses and they'll go through them and they're like, I mean, if this is what's free, you know, I'm paying $300 for this uh, type of course somewhere else. You're just giving this away to me for free. Mm-hmm. So, w- like, what does your paid stuff look like? So, uh, yeah, that's and that's it, a really good way to... what it looks like is that we yeah. put a lot of time and energy and into accessibility it. accessibility of information is incredibly important to mm-hmm. us. So, yeah. like, making <clears throat> info... The 99% of what we do is free. It's really important to me and, and us and part of our mission at Girls Gone Strong is making high quality health and fitness information available to women and health and fitness professionals who work with women across the globe, particularly people who would not otherwise have geographic or socioeconomic access to this information. Mm-hmm. And it just doesn't exist anywhere. Yeah. You can't find the evidence-based mm-hmm. interdisciplinary stuff, particularly with like a body positive spin yeah. to it, right? Mm-hmm. So they, it just doesn't exist I mean, anywhere. We're going out and we're getting, we're going beyond strength coaches. We're getting... Um, PhD in molecular biology, psychology, exercise science, women's studies, um, rehabilitation OBGYN. science, OBGYNs, uh, physiotherapists, um, registered dietitians. I think that's doctors. one of the most unique things that you guys do, that you yeah. bring an interdisciplinary approach to strength training for women and training for women. We try because like yeah. if you're going to have the a most com- important thing, if you're going to have a conversation with a woman about pelvic organ prolapse, right, you need to know the anatomy and physiology. You also need to be thinking about like mm-hmm. how is how I'm speaking about this to her going to affect her experience with prolapse. So people who aren't familiar with prolapse, pelvic organ prolapse Mm -hmm. is when one or more of a woman's pelvic organs Mm -hmm. begin to slump. And sometimes they actually end up descending out of the vagina. And that's one of the things that I was saying earlier, up to 19% of women will have surgery for incontinence, which is um, involuntary leakage of urine or feces or gas or pelvic organ prolapse. Like if you, 
are talking to a woman about this and you're talking to her about it in like a really sad, devastating way, like it's going to negatively affect her performance and her ability to do the activities that she loves. And how like, she can, thinks about her body. Yeah, and how she thinks about her body. Like that is going to have a negative effect on how she thinks about her body, her performance, her symptoms. And so um, if you if you just have the anatomy and physiology and you don't have a psychologist coming in or you don't have someone who's, you know, educated in pain science or whatever, for example, come in and say like, hey, th- like you have pelvic organ prolapse, like that's a thing. And, you know, it can be difficult to hear, but this, you can still live a amazing, active, healthy lifestyle and do the things that you love. Let's try some conservative, you know, treatments and management of this at first. And here's somebody that I can refer you to. And I'm going to work with your physical therapist so that we're doing things that are, you know, helping you feel better and not aggravating your symptoms. And mm-hmm. you can talk to me about this. So yeah, that's why it's, um, it's again, like so important to have that kind of holistic approach to it, because you, if you're just doing the sets and the reps and the anatomy and physiology and biology, like you're missing so much of that coach client experience, or even again, like if a woman's reading an article and we're like, wah, wah, you have pelvic organ prolapse versus like, Hey, this is a thing. And like, you know, like a you're lot gonna of be women fine. live. Yeah, yeah, you're going to be fine. A lot of women live like super happy, healthy, active lives with this. So, so we spoke a lot about the the psychological aspect of training, coaching a woman. Um, are there, if there are any, in your opinion, do you think there's any differences uh, as far as the actual training goes mm-hmm. um, when you're devising a plan for a female? That's a great question. Um, and this is one of the reasons, too, that I work with a bunch of other experts because yeah, I yeah. can only be an expert in so many things. Yeah. So I think in... No, I expect you to know everything. Every single <laughs> thing. Um, I was super interested to see this meta-analysis that Greg Knuckles did mm-hmm. back in 2018, mm-hmm. uh, comparing... There had never been a meta-analysis comparing um, male and female strength and muscle gains. Mm-hmm. And they were actually, like... I think he said they were... I think they were almost exactly aligned. Like there was no significant difference in the amount of strength and muscle that Mm -hmm. males and females can gain. I think women over 35 gained a little, it was either a little bit more strength or a little bit more muscle more quickly than the men. There are a lot of reasons for that. They might be, I think these were mostly untrained individuals. Um, And so they could have, you know, been doing less activity than the men. So the men had already gained a bit of strength, Mm -hmm. you know, um, But, you know, in general, like, our training programs are pretty, like, standard. Like, Casey does the training programs and stuff that we write for for GGS. Um, So besides trying to take into account the things for pregnancy and postpartum, paying attention to things like leaking urine, incontinence, pelvic organ prolapse, pelvic pain, things like that, paying attention to in, like, a coaching setting one-on-one, like, uh, it's more... Like how comfortable does she feel with certain exercises? Like, are you going to have a a 17 year old volleyball player who's kind of shy wearing volleyball shorts, doing hip thrusts or glute bridges in a gym full of guys? Like, you know, it's that kind of stuff that we think about a little bit more um, in terms of writing the training programs. I think women can, uh, depending on like their strength levels and stuff, can typically handle a little bit more volume than men tend to get, um, can handle a little bit higher, uh, more reps at a little bit higher percentage of their max but most of the women that we're working with aren't quite at that elite level of training. We work with a lot of general population women, so not a lot of huge differences in that way. Mm-hmm. How, how would uh, training change? It's something I've always been very, very curious about and haven't taken time to research or dabble in that myself I for a pregnant woman. Oh, yeah, that's a great question. Before so, we move on to a pregnant woman, let me close off the uh, differences between male and females and reference the article by Greg Knuckles. So... I'm going to just read like the, the closing thoughts from that article just to, to give you a more um, objective opinion. So the first thing he points out is that women tend to be less acutely fatigable than men. So they can do more reps at a given percentage of one, uh, one rep max, do more sets with a fixed number of reps or given a percentage of one rep max or both. Um, and that has to do with a couple of factors. One, that they the females tend to have a high proportion of type 1 muscle fibers that are more fatigue resistant <clears throat> and that they have less muscle mass, so they don't occlude blood vessels as fast when they lift. Second thing, they may recover from training a bit faster than men. Um, that's it for that point. Men and women may respond differently to low, low training. And women also have to deal with the menstrual cycle. 
<clears throat> so you have to take into account uh, hormones. There's some evidence that women's response to training is varied on the menstrual cycle phases that they're at. So that that's good. Yeah, in our, like our certification when we talk about, uh, can we talk about women in menstrual cycle real quick? Totally. Um, so in our certification, we the, one of the women who does a lot of the research for us, her name's Dr. Helen Colius. She was director of research at Precision Nutrition and was a researcher at Johns Hopkins. And she, <laughs> uh, basically what she's explained to me and the way that I understand it, the easiest way to explain it is that there is basically the evidence in terms of changing a woman's training program according to her menstrual cycle, there's no significant evidence that it's, that it's necessary for most or all women and that the variation among women and their experiences across their menstrual cycle is greater than the average of a woman across her menstrual cycle. So the easy way to think about it like this is if you look at average uh, height of a female, right? Five, four, five, five, average height of a male, five, 10, only five inches. But if you look at uh, women's heights, right? From however many feet tall, all the way up to their women who are like six feet five, that variation among women is greater than the variation than the average of men and women. So same thing, kind of thing with a menstrual cycle. So like me during my luteal phase, I might feel significantly different than Steffi during her luteal phase. Mm -hmm. So there's more variation among women across different phases of their menstrual cycle than there is on average across a woman's menstrual cycle, if that makes sense. So you mm -hmm. might have some women that, you know, feel really crappy in the week leading up to their period and they're, you know, bloated and lethargic and irritable and anxious. You might have women who feel horrible while they're actually bleeding. You might have women who during ovulation, which is about halfway through their cycle, um, have what's called middle schmerz, which is basically when they're actually ovulating, they're having pain. So the way that Helen puts it is she's like, listen, for most women, um, unless they are experiencing, they have significant issues with their period, really heavy bleeding, pain, cramps, things like that, which by the way, periods are not supposed to be painful. There's a myth that periods are supposed to be painful, but that can actually sensitize the nervous system to pain. So periods are not supposed to actually be painful, can actually make people more likely to experience pain in other areas of their, um, of their body and their life. If they think that like having pain every month with their, with menstruation is normal. Interesting. Um, but, uh, what was I saying? Oh, she said, she said <laughs> that unless a, an individual has significant issues with their period and their menstrual cycle, that other things like sleep and nutrition and stress and things like that are going to affect their training so much more. It's kind of like, you know, just thinking like, oh, well, your temperature's elevated by one degree during this phase right. or whatever, you know, that it's probably not going to have as much of an effect as, um, as other bigger life factors. Are they hydrated? Have they eaten? Do they get enough rest? Are they fighting with their spouse? You know, that mm -hmm. kind of stuff. So interesting. Yeah. So go ahead. You can answer Alex's question about pregnancy. How does it vary? What do you yeah. change with factors or yeah. some of the main ones? That's a great question. So, uh, first of all, strength training, a mix of strength training and cardio is recommended in pregnancy. So there are a couple of myths about strength training during pregnancy. Number one is that you can't start anything new. And number two is that you can keep doing what you were always doing. Neither of those are necessarily correct. So you can absolutely start um, exercising in pregnancy, even if you did not exercise before, assuming you are cleared by your doctor, you don't have any contraindications, which is a really fancy way of saying this could hurt you. Um, there are absolute contraindications and then there are relative contraindications. So some that it's like, hey, you absolutely can't train no matter what. Um, but as long as you're cleared by your doctor, uh, it is safe to start strength training. You're just supposed to start at a low intensity and work your way up to a moderate intensity and not um, ever exceed training at a beyond a moderate intensity during pregnancy in terms of keeping doing what you were doing before uh, for the most part that works at least in the beginning of pregnancy um, one thing that's contraindicated is hit high intensity interval training you are not supposed to train uh, at that nine and a half to ten out of ten on like a perceived effort scale or rate of perceived exertion um, that's considered too much you're not supposed to exercise really over like an eight and a half ish um, elite level like athletes, they, uh, there's, they can be an exception. So if they're working at that, like really vigorous intensity around the eight and a half or nine, they're supposed to be monitored by their doctor or somebody who understands that, um, in terms of actually strength training. So both strength training and cardio are encouraged in pregnancy by all of the big, um, governing bodies and, uh, first trimester, a lot of women are feeling fatigue sickness, things like that. Other than that, their training program doesn't really need to change except based on their energy levels. Trimester two, as the belly starts to grow a little bit, um, that you might make some small modifications just based on, <laughs> based on their size. 
Uh, some people say that you are not supposed to lie on your back after about 16 weeks of pregnancy because the baby could compress the vena cava, which delivers blood back to your heart. However, um, if you are lying on your back and exercising, that blood flow only decreases by about 50%. And there are other governing bodies who say, like, the idea is that you're not supposed to lay on your back for like you can only lay on your back for short bouts of time, but like, what is a short bout of time? Is that 30 seconds? Is that 60 seconds? Mm -hmm. Is that two minutes? Do they define um, it? Uh, they, not that I have seen. So okay. I could be wrong on that, but as far as I know, they have not defined it other than short bouts. Um, and then the other thing is like women lie on their back on the table when they get like their, when they get their mm -hmm. ultrasound, you know, you know, women roll over to their back when they sleep and things like that. So I believe it's one of the governing bodies in Australia who says. And when you're about to give birth too. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so you can, um, so some people say you shouldn't do it. Other people say it's <clears throat> fine as long as you're not experiencing dizziness, lightheadedness, fatigue, things like that. Um, and then other people are like, hey, just to be safe, ele elevate your back 15%. Yeah. Um, And then you're just paying attention to symptoms like, are you leaking urine? Like I said, 48 to 67% of women will leak urine by week 30 of pregnancy. Doesn't mean that they're necessarily doing anything wrong. It just means that their body can't manage the pressure and it's kind of like pelvic floor is the weakest link or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, so paying attention to heaviness, bulging, dragging, um, leaking urine, pelvic pain, things like that. And then a lot of women are concerned about diastasis recti. Are you mm -hmm. familiar with diastasis recti? I'm not. Okay. Rectus abdominis muscles, you've got the linea alba, which is the connective tissue between them, and it starts to thin as the body makes room for the baby. This is a really good thing. This is your body being super smart and adapting to pregnancy. So as the belly grows, those start to separate. The linea alba thins a little bit. Um, it used to be believed that doing exercises that cause pressure on the linea alba, so planks and push-ups and things like that, would make diastasis recti worse. The thing is, we don't actually know what makes diastasis recti worse. Uh, we think there's a genetic component to it. Um, however, if you want to be extra conservative, what we always say is like, we don't really know what makes it worse, but it seems prudent to not put a ton of extra pressure on mm -hmm. that connective tissue if possible. Mm -hmm. So we tend to say like, hey, we're not saying this is going to prevent it. We're not saying it's going to make it better, but we tend to as the belly starts to get bigger, um, move women to incline push-ups, incline mm -hmm. planks, things like that, mm -hmm. and pay attention if there is any what they call bulging or doming or coning. So sometimes you'll see uh, a pregnant woman do an exercise and you'll notice she has like, literally it looks like just like a thin, like mm. kind of bulgy thing in the middle of her abdominal muscles. At that point, it would be like, okay, same thing. She's not managing that intra-abdominal pressure well. It's not mm -hmm. spread throughout her abdomen. It's kind of coming out in the middle. So at that point in time, you might want to reduce... You can reduce the load. <clears throat> you can change the exercise. You can change where she's holding the load. You can have her do, you know, reduce the volume of it a little bit. Um, so, yeah, it's really just paying attention to those symptoms, listening to your body. Strength training and cardio are both great. High impact exercise is something that you want to pay attention to as well. Are you experiencing heaviness, feeling like something's going to fall out, leaking, things like that? But in general, pregnant women are super strong and resilient and badass and can keep training throughout their pregnancy as long as yeah, you know lift if they want to lift yeah as long as they're listening to their body and are you know if they want to do high impact stuff if they're leaking and they don't care like okay that's their choice you know what i mean sure. they get to they get to manage the risks and rewards of it so so we'll take like questions like these that that she's fielding and we'll create courses and free blueprints and stuff and we just give them out to coaches as resources that they can use so somebody come they're they're training one of their clients their client comes and it's like i'm pregnant now uh we have like how to get started with this whole process. And then you can identify like if you want to refer out to somebody else at one point or if you want to take the steps to get all the knowledge and tools and stuff. So. Yeah, or we'll have like a, we have an exercises to do and avoid during and after pregnancy because that's everyone's question. Mm -hmm. But it's not don't do this exercise. It's not like you can't do planks. It's like don't do exercises where you're feeling bulging or yeah. you think something's going to fall Be out. You're more know, it's conscious kind of, when yeah, you're doing those exactly. exercises. It's more yeah. like categories. What to pay attention to. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Very yep. cool. Very cool. Awesome. That makes a lot of sense. And then the postpartum myth, which I would love to bust really quickly as well. Please there's a do six, it. There's a six. I'm like, I could go off on this all day. <laughs> there's a six week postpartum myth. Um, and that's a myth in both directions. Uh, people say like, don't do anything for six weeks. As soon as you hit the six week mark, you're cleared for exercise. But um, number one, 
like don't do anything for six weeks is not actually true. So women oftentimes are having to do the tasks of daily living, right? They're having to get up and down off the toilet. Mm -hmm. They might be they're definitely carrying their baby. They might be picking up other children, carrying groceries, doing the wash, things like that. So a during that time, again, they're doing all that stuff in a relatively uncontrolled environment. They're not like really conscious of exactly how they're picking up their kid, right? They're just their kids screaming, they pick them up. So not doing like gentle, progressive strength training or uh, body weight strength training exercises in a more controlled environment, mm -hmm. like in a 10 or 15 minute like body weight exercise program, but they're just supposed to go about their life. You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. that's, that doesn't happen with other like surgeries and major events that people have, there's a slow progressive return to exercise. Mm -hmm. So people are like, don't do anything for six weeks. And it's like, Hey, you know, like some, some body weight squats, some glute bridges, some like light stretches, some like, you know, gentle upper body work and stuff being caught like that can all be really powerful and nourishing mm -hmm. for the body and can actually help speed healing. And then at six weeks, they're like, you're good to go. And it's like, hold on a second. Yeah, That's yeah. definitely not how it works. Right. Uh, Casey ruptured his patella tendon three years ago yesterday. And he had a very specific protocol with the surgeon and the physical therapist and the things he was supposed to be doing at home to return to exercise. Mm -hmm. That doesn't happen with C-sections. Women actually have to fight with their doctors to get a referral to physical therapy. Yeah, it's wild. After they literally just had their bodies cut open and their baby pulled out. So, um, yeah, so not doing anything the first six weeks is not necessarily true. As long as you are doing gentle body weight stuff that is no more strenuous than tasks of daily living, it can actually help you improve your rehab and recovery and return to exercise. And then you can do whatever you want at six weeks is also not true. That doesn't make any sense. We don't tell anyone that that that's how it should work when they're recovering from any other type of like injury or illness. Mm -hmm. Like one day you're just like good to go. Um, so slowly returning to exercise in an intelligent, progressive way, building up over time, which it just sounds ridiculous that we even have to be like, say that, because that is such a, like, just obvious foundational principle of strength and conditioning. Absolutely. But, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it all comes down to having the right guidance. And that's why we need people like you guys. Thanks. Amazing. <laughs> you want to move on to the next topic? All right. Yeah. What do we got? I mean, that was so insightful. I loved that. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, and what do we got for this week? We got some some fitness uh, industry gossip. What do we got? Do you have an intro for that? Hey, you got some sound effects over there? You were going crazy with the soundboard the other day. Yeah, 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 yeah. I have some. It's <laughs> taking too long. <laughs> no. Okay, so I have two. This uh, one? Oh, so I'll give a side note. If you guys hear snoring in the background this whole time, <laughs> it's not Marcus Leone like he was on episode <laughs> one. Uh, this is Riley laying on my lap, snoring up a storm. Hey, Riley, Dexter I'm not boring. Everything. And where's our sound effect? Come on. I, I just did it. Time, dude. Okay, well, I just did it. What was it? All right. Drinking tea. Oh, oh right. The okay. tea sound effect. The tea. Did you hear what I was All right, Dexter, listening? you got to get out of here, buddy. After the, after the after party. Yeah. Jen. Okay, we had three for today, didn't we? No way. I kind of saw it coming, but... You know, <laughs> now, you went from having too short of a sound clip to, there. That's totally to totally way too I'm long of a sound clip. <laughs> and we can't hear it, so we're not laughing. We can never I can never please you, Alex. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the first one that I wanted to talk about was this new trend that we're seeing some power lifters do. It's catching a little bit of steam, uh, and that's uh, the no free advertising thing. We heard about this? I have not heard about this. I'm okay, out on so all. I don't know any gossip about it. Hold on, hold on, ever. hold on for a second. Like when you say some powerlifters, you mean like there's one, more than one because I've yeah, only yeah. seen one powerlifter. No, there's been a few. There's been a few. A few? There's one, but there was there's comments saying that there's other people who were doing it first, but this one is just being very proud and adamant of it. I see. So apparently, but nobody's pick, it's Fran picking up. Francesco, who's like my ear into you know the gossip world, the gossip world of of USAPL things has uh said that it's been picking up uh, a little bit of traction so basically what's happening is some power lifters feel that they they don't want to be advertising things they're not getting paid for mm. but they're going so far as to like turn the plates inside so you can't see what company the plates are oh you know or like wear knee sleeves inside out or do things that are uh, like just not not showing logos and brands mm. um so yeah, I wanted to hear. Well, there ends up being the 
freaking logos in the background and the rest of their gym anyway. <laughs> like, come on, go full. If you're going to do something, go 100%. You know, get some duct tape. Cover the logos in your entire gym <laughs> yeah, for that film session paint, that you're about to out. do. You know what I mean? Put duct tape over your shoes. You know, wear your shirt inside out. Like, if, you, if you're gonna be, if you're gonna be real, be real. You know what I mean? Yeah, be real. Be about it. You yeah. know. Do so you think? So do you think this is? So I had two thoughts on this. I thought one first is this just people trying to, you know, be, you know cause like you know cause some controversy and just get people talking. Get is some clout, some internet clout, some, some internet, internet clout? attention. Or is this like a case of you know? An ego, too yeah, inflated. You know, or, or, yeah, thoughts of just high level, like self importance. I think it could be a combination of both. Or it Does will any maybe of those guys have a big platform? That well, the one person maybe it's because he, he's such a high level lifter in that world. It's, it's him as a ploy, like, hey, Who's that? X company notice me so that maybe you'll start paying me like you pay one of the other top lifters in the USAPL and the IPF. You know, Taylor. Oh, you're talking about Taylor Atwood. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But here. Sure. You see someone I mean, he, like Ray Williams, lifter, but who's, he's, who's sponsored by Rogue. But you I think know? that guy only has like thirty or forty thousand followers on 50. Instagram. But he's one of the he's one of the top in the IPF. You know. But you think Rogue cares? You think Rogue's at HQ going, "Damn it, that would flipping his plates inside out." Yeah, you know. <laughs> Somebody write this guy a six figure check. <laughs> you know. If they if they all come <laughs> together and more and more of, of them are doing it, they will have some sort of power. They'll create some sort of power. I mean, like we're seeing this in all kinds of sports now. Like the last 10 years with social media, the players in almost every sporting league have more power than they've ever had. Like they are literally able to uh, manipulate situations for players to be traded with them, for sure. to, to get a move to cities. Uh, even the NFL, which has always been like about the shield, is now having opportunities for people to use their power and uh, create more wealth and money from it and advertising opportunities. And you're talking about a sport, I guess, where people are dedicating their entire lives to this at the same level of some of these other sports, right? You're a power mm -hmm. lifter. Hold on, hold on, hold on. <laughs> are you calling powerlifting a sport, buddy? <laughs> I don't know about all that now. You're comparing dude millionaires making a living off this to dudes trying to get Ten dollars a month from Rogue, you know I, what I mean? I, I hear you. I hear you. <laughs> and, uh, and I'm not even saying that I fall somewhere on it. I'm just kind of talking about it, like, uh, you know, if if this is what you do for a living, and this is how you're going to make a money, you know, and put food on your table, and you're literally giving your body away to this. Right. I guess it's not a sport. What is it? <laughs> it's uh, obviously a sport. What's wrong with you, Alex? You know, <laughs> like, I'm, just, I'm just saying, like, uh, I, I think I can understand. And, uh, like, one person doing it, you probably don't get a lot of power from it. It starts to become a trend and more and more people are doing it. Then the companies, which are actually making all the money off of this, right, then they have to start taking notice and they have to start paying uh them to be, I guess, influencers in some ways. And we're seeing this influencer marketing starting to be a thing, right? Sure. But it's it's basically based on uh, I mean, I think how big your following is, right? They're going to pay for your likes or your YouTube channel or your whatever. Uh, but these guys, maybe they don't have that, but a lot of their lifts and the video that they're making is viral-esque content that people like to watch and, and see. So um, I don't know. It's interesting. But I, I think, yeah, that I mean, that's a good point that I didn't think of before, just the power and numbers of the whole thing. But I also think that Rogue and some of those bigger companies, they sponsor people in different categories for different reasons. For like, for example, Rogue sponsors Half Thor Bjornsson, who's the mountain in Game of Thrones. That guy has such a high level of totally. exposure that it to makes total sense for them to pay. And he's number one in his sport. He is number one. Ray Williams has been number There's, one in the IPF. But if you, you know? look at some of uh, the power lifters, um, you know, maybe that Rogue sponsors, they're not cutting the big checks, or they're people who don't have huge followings that are right. uh, who are well respected. Like uh, they sponsor Kim Wofford, Steph. You're yeah. saying. So I think maybe that just looks good on them to sort of give back to the powerlifting community and maybe the exposure they're getting from that isn't so much 
what they care about with that sponsorship, but just being able to be like, hey, look at this up and comer that we are helping out. And here's another I mean? thing: they totally. don't have to do that because they are they are the number one equipment manufacturer right now. Their prices are so competitive. They're made here in the U.S. You know, you want to get you know competition powerlifting plates. They're going to be your cheapest source to do it. Sure. The fastest source to do it, you know, the easiest source to do it. Sure. They don't need someone representing it. If you just Google search, uh, Google search competition powerlifting plates, that's probably going to be the resource that you use. You know what I mean? Yeah. Him using them and advertising them, I don't think is getting any additional business. Sure. You know, but I mean, I don't, I don't that, think he's necessarily specifically targeting uh, Rogue, though. It's just all companies, isn't it? Yeah. I, I think it, that what makes it most noticeable is Rogue in the specific plates, you know? Sure. Yeah, I, I mean, it's, it's so funny. I saw a branding. comment on his post, well, the first post that he started doing, where people started going off. They're like, "Buddy, you need to put some duct tape on your Adidas shoes, then, yeah. you know, because he's wearing Adidas lifters. So you, well, you're, you're advertising Adidas right there, you know." Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I think it's tough. It's I think it's going to be tough for anybody to pull off because, mm-hmm. let's say you do cover the Adidas logo. I mean, some of the NFL players that have deals, right? They're having to, they have to black out logos. You can still tell what kind of shoe it is. Yeah. Especially in something like an Adidas weightlifting shoe. Like it's such a distinctive look. And there's what are the there's like three shoes you can choose from. I also don't think that's gonna incentivate brands to offer contracts to them. I think it's quite the opposite. You know, sometimes brands are incentivated to sponsor you when they see that you have a genuine interest for the brand. You know? Yeah. And I mean, until sure. there's a, a ton of them who are doing it and then you're like, Okay, do we have a problem? Yeah, here that's or whatever. The thing. Is it reducing so, your sales? But how many? So your, like yeah. other uh, other sports have unions for players and if you're play, if say if you're a tennis player you probably have an agent but there's like not enough money in this sport right so that sure. there's not a union and there's not a uh an agent or whatever and so like i i think it just seems like you're i don't know what you're operating out of but it seems like you're just like hey like i'm literally dedicating my life to this craft and I feel like I should be compensated in some way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it's when, you, when you show yeah, up and you only do it on a small scale for yourself, it's not going to amount to anything. But if a lot of people decided that that makes sense to them and they were to do it, maybe it sure. amounted to something. I but guess, the, and, and those movements have to start somewhere, right? It mm-hmm. starts with one yeah, person. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and everybody's and, usually pointing and being like, look and, at this. And, you yeah. know, and look at this person. Like fitness yeah. is a bit, there's Until a lot works. of commerce mm-hmm. involved in fitness, and there's quite a bit of commerce involved in powerlifting. And yeah. the, the guys that are dedicating their life to the craft aren't really the ones. I mean, some people are making some money in it, but I would say that the guys who are usually protected by maybe the players union and the NBA or the NFL or whatever, those are the guys that have no agent and have no way to make money and maybe don't even have the business acumen to, to, to turn to what they're doing out, into, yeah, in, into sure. an actual sustainable uh, it's life hard. for them. Turning something so, into something that works is you know, hard. <laughs> I said, there's usually like with the, where there's an action or something that it's like the iceberg thing. Like you're seeing like the, the tip of it that's poking out of the water like what's going on underneath there and stuff and usually you may i would think people make decisions based on like things that are affecting their ability to make money and put food on the table and stuff that's usually where you start making decisions to do something radical or whatnot yeah i think it's a fair perspective mm-hmm. all right what do we got next it's interesting that was a good one. Mm-hmm. I like that. It's it's good. It's, Taylor it's, Atwood, if you want to be on our podcast, come at me, bro. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Slide into my I don't DMs, know why you're dog. being so aggressive. You could just, just come kidding. state <laughs> his, his point. <laughs> but yeah, let us know what you think. No, think that's a good one, though. It, it's cool to get someone's perspective who's a little bit removed from the direct Power powerlifting yeah, space. And by that, yeah. you mean totally removed totally from removed. direct <laughs> powerlifting. Yeah. No, I yeah. saw you doing some deadlifts there. <laughs> Yeah, oh, so you have to be a power for the deadlift nowadays, <laughs> <Yeah>. huh? <laughs> That's right. What uh, what else we got? Oh, Jamal Browner. I thought it was kind of cool because he's everybody's criticism of him has always been that he can't hold on to the heavy deadlifts. But, but uh, now, now my boy's holding on. Yeah. Now, now your boy's hold, next hanging on. Is to be the showdown coming up in how many weeks now? Is it eight weeks? Eight. Eight weeks. Damn, that's coming up cool. You got a little weird. You got a little smirk on your face. You ready for it? No. No, <laughs> yeah, me neither. I'm not even doing it. I'm just running it. I'm already dreading that. I'm like, oh my god, I gotta do this, gotta do that, gotta. Do oh boy. But we'll be all right, we'll be all right, sisters. I, I'm Congrats. honestly, I'm really hoping that he puts up something good because I've seen him be disappointed yeah. a, a bunch of times in meets, hitting huge numbers in training and not being able to do it on the platform. But he just did like a 9:35 deadlift, right? Hook grip, mm-hmm. and he, and he's, 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 he's always looked like 
everyone looked at him as a one-trick pony, and I think at Bossa Bossas he showed that he's not squatting yeah. well over seven in sleeves, Decent benching bench too. 475, you yeah. know, all as a light 275, going to be 242. So he'll be a, he'll be very well-rounded. If he can get together that deadlift, I think he can easily go for the 242 all-time world record in sleeves. The total. The total. The total. Yeah. Damn, that would so. be pretty cool for him. I think so. Who, who has it? Kevin Oak is the one who has it right now, I think, right? The is total? It? Two. I don't know what the uh, total is, but I'm pretty sure Kevin Oak's the one who has the total in sleeves right now. Dude, what did Kaler just break? Was that 220? 220, 220 okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that'll be cool. We also have uh, Juji competing at the Juji's showdown. Juji's competing at the and showdown. It, aren't you co- are you coaching him for that? So we had a phone conference yesterday. He's like, I don't know. What do I do? I just am used to doing all kinds of crazy things. Is this Juji Mufu? Juji yeah. Mufu. Okay, I was introduced yeah. to Juji Mufu for the first time. Well, no, I haven't met him in person, but uh, Meg introduced me to him. So she's like, do you know Juji Mufu? Besides so. his Instagram and stuff mm-hmm. like that? Oh, yeah. yeah. He's Such amazing. a cool guy. Such a cool guy. Well, I, so We had seen viral videos that he's oh, made over absolutely. the years. They're everywhere. Absolutely. <laughs> he's, he's one of the OGs with that. He's been yeah. doing that for so long. And he's come down to Miami a couple of times. We've gone up there. He's been really good friends of ours. Our last showdown, which was a little over a year ago, he did just the deadlift only portion of it. Had a lot of fun. And it was unsanctioned. So now this year, it's it's completely sanctioned, full power. He's never done a powerlifting meet. So it's going to be his first powerlifting meet ever. And he's never... He told me he's never really trained full powerlifting mode, so he's gonna stop doing less crazy sh- flips and yeah. shit. I told him he could still do some of it, you know. <laughs> I was so say, I'm helping so him structure his training a bit. And what was his training history before that? Like, has he followed ever followed a structured program, or is he just he told he told when on our phone conference history he said he completely just trains intuitively. Based on, uh, he told me he can't follow a direct schedule. He can't, like, <laughs> I can't tell him one day he has to always squat. He yeah. can't just because how things are up and down. But he just kind of goes in and just does whatever for the day and that's been is pretty much most yeah. of his training i've out. trained like that too yeah. yeah yeah my last few training blocks have been like that just intuitive i have like a set amount of of um kind of work or times that i have to squat or deadlift or bench and then i you're not sure what day it's going to be no, on I'm that's not, exactly, exactly what he told me he said i don't know when i'm going to do it five days at least you know yeah i don't know when i'm going to do it it depends on like what i'm fe- how i'm feeling that day what mm-hmm. i'm feeling up for and then i just kind of do it by feel yeah. Well, it's working out for you. Just <laughs> yeah. It's going pretty well. Yeah. It's going right. fine now. Yeah. What else we got? I think that's it for for uh, industry gossip. Yeah. We don't have that much. We're slow today. We recorded another po- a two hour uh, podcast today. Yeah. <coughs> oh, did you guys? Yeah. Yeah. yeah you not look tired. Not, yeah, not ours. You guys got a new car. Where? 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 That's sick. That's true. We yeah. stepped it up. We stepped sick. it up. Upgrade. We're gonna try not to kill ourselves in this one. Yeah. <laughs> uh, all right. See, what do you got for uh, Florida, man? So we're uh, grab my computer. Now everyone knows the password to your computer, Steph. Everybody. Jesus. <laughs> You're trying to look up a Florida man. Oh, Jesus, no, going to be about 6,000 Florida you know, here, so I was Basel. thinking about the way that we do Florida Man stories. I think it would be cool if we do it, we search the specific day. Mm. Okay, so today is what? December 5th? Uh-huh. And uh, like an pick a number, day. 1 to 5. 4. So we're going to search <laughs> December like 5th, 4 years ago. <laughs> Oh, so it's what? Like a Facebook what's on 2019 this day for minus Florida four? Man. <laughs> 2015. 2015. Yep. Memory for Florida, Florida man. man. Here we go. So th- th- this this you way suck, we don't get to pick and choose. We don't get to you know oh, you scroll through them. We're the just microwave, gonna microwave. we just gotta trust that the Florida men aren't gonna let us down. You know what right. I mean? Florida do you guys man. Remember that uh, when December it was trending 5th, to do. 2015. Like Florida man, you type your birthday and you see what happened oh, on your birthday. And no. Ev- that was every media single thing for a while. you had every day had a Oh, we should, we should do the birthday of the people that we were talking to. <laughs> yeah, yeah, let's do that. Let's do that. Okay. <laughs> Wait, well, he's already got something. Oh, okay. oh. <laughs> Too slow, Alex. Man dies after almost completing 10th day of Destroy Dick December. A 21-year-old man was rushed to the hospital after almost completing the 10th day of Destroy Dick December Destroyed and Dick? died. Yeah, I'm guessing it means. Pardon me. You, you, I, 
<laughs> masturbate. Yeah, well, I know there's this, you know, there's all these different, this no sober no, October, not November. no shave November. No, not November. I, uh, <laughs> or no shave November for an actual cause. Hold on, something you load the rest of the article. Hold on. <laughs> Tenth, let me go. This is pretty crazy, huh? Caesar <laughs> does no, not November all year round. He's a virgin. Yeah. <laughs> okay, no, here's, here, here's the full I'm article, it looks like. He's an incel. <laughs> it didn't do the right date. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Uh, it, he, so, after completing the 10th day of destroyed Dick December, he, des- he died several hours later of a heart attack. Dehydration? Oh. When he was trying to fap for the last time. Oh, okay. Trying oh, to destroy like Dick December as the challenge which consists on fapping on each day of December the same amount of times as the day of the month. Oh. Fapping? So he was fapping. Jerking Ay, <laughs> coño. Oh. Wait, so he had a heart attack? The cha- from this from challenge is, from <laughs> this challenge is the opposite. <laughs> so it's the opposite to No Nut November. And many this people is. refuse to participate due to its risks it involves. But this man didn't care. He tried <laughs> to do it and it went terribly wrong. How many times you got a fap? Yeah, the, yeah, well, the he died on the, the day. Tenth. So it's like. So the tenth day would be ten uh, times. Oh my god! So, oh. yeah, that's right. Yo, that's that dick be raw. You <laughs> 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 know what I'm saying? I have, I have like just a huge feeling that. Oh this, my gosh, uh, my mom's gonna listen to this. This yeah. is a fake article. Oh, man. That you is didn't not. Kick out family. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, uh, guys, hold on. I got an update. Like I said, that seemed like a fake uh, website to me. Here it says that that was a hoax. Don't worry, I think guys. He, I think this here he's five, alive. You're back on Florida Man duty. <laughs> yeah, I'll get <laughs> But hey, at least it gave us a good <laughs> conversation. Dude, that's it. Perfect. That was our fucking Florida Man. Hey, yeah. before, before we wrap. That, I tried. I tried. But the thing is, is like it was believable. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, that like, was, like, that's the. Jeez. That's the. Don't over masturbate, kids. I'm going to tell that story to my son it's one day. Healthy. You know what <laughs> I mean? What about the hairy palms? Isn't that what they used to say back in the day? What? You know. Yeah. Sure. Um, before we wrap, mm-hmm. I think we skipped the what's going on at Hybrid. Doesn't matter. Any, nothing knows going touching? on at Hybrid. Nothing well, new. we Same just one. got the official keys to the Fantasy Factory, baby. We got the keys? Well, no. But we, got, <laughs> <laughs> we got the keys, though. Well, you know what I mean? We'll December 15th, we'll have the keys. Okay. Yeah, yeah. 10 and days. We have the keys, then we can talk about it. Uh, well, we've been we haven't talked about, about this. You know what's insane? What? Uh, have you, are you guys familiar with Curb Your Enthusiasm? Yeah. Yes. Uh, of course. I've heard of it, but I haven't seen it. Okay. My man. <laughs> Our <laughs> landlord is literally Larry David awesome. incarnated. That's great. <laughs> and it's great, but terrible. Imagine trying to have it to interact with this guy. It's all over the place, like telling these stories. and just like I personally love it. It. Oh, I love, love it too. Alex. But I deal with him way more than you do. <laughs> That's true. He, That's like, he true. called me randomly the other day about the, the new building that we have, and he's like, "Oh, listen, listen. So, uh, you know, about the artwork. I really like the artwork." And I'm like, uh, uh, "What?" And he's like, "Yeah, <laughs> you know, it's Winwood. There's a lot of art, and we gotta appreciate the art." And and I'm like, "Okay, sounds sounds good." He's like, "All right, so you're not gonna paint over it, right?" And I'm like, "No, I didn't say I was going to." He's like, "All right, we'll talk. We'll talk." He just hangs up on me. <laughs> and I'm like, oh. He was, and he's he talking called me to talk at about that art. time. He was talking about the building that we hadn't even signed the lease on yet. Right. Oh. They wow. <laughs> liked the artwork on the outside. I'm like, oh, all right. All right. Yeah, we like it too. <laughs> okay. Yes. Uh, awesome. Where uh, where can people find more information about your coaches certification and your training programs? Yeah. So that's a great question. So we are in the middle of overhauling our website and our social media right now. So I chatted with you a little bit about this a couple weeks ago, but basically while we've been developing those certifications, I mean, one of them is a 500 page textbook with 300 references. The other one's a 600 page textbook with a thousand references. Mm So those were giant undertakings and there were 16 to 17 women who wrote each of them. So how long did it take for, for you guys to write that? Um, we went at it hard. Yeah, we went. It, it, I mean, really, the entire journey was years. Yeah, it was years. But like to actually churn out like the uh, the six hundred page textbook was probably like eight or nine months, something like okay. that. Um, but you know, that's a team of seventeen people working on it, which can make it go faster oh, and so and can well it can uh, also make it, it go a little. Hard, you know, because yeah. you're yeah. depending on other people too. Yeah, yep. because all the every all the people talking, all the comments, and it's not every. like, hey, Helen, you write this chapter, and Marika, you write this chapter. It's like no six six to 10 of you are going to review every single one and you're going to talk through these points and you're going to, because that, that's the perspectives and stuff, you know? Um, we hadn't, uh, you know, Not these were our, level. these were our first certification. So we'd never done anything like that, but nothing sees the light of day at girls gone strong without being 
seen or worked on by at least three to four people, but to have six to 10 and to have them all have different perspectives. Like I very purposefully chose people who had different areas of expertise and even slightly different perspectives so that we could give all the context about whatever we were talking about. Um, so yeah, so those took a while. So anyway, long story short, our website and our social media at this moment is not super um, indicative of like the, the type of stuff that we do, but you can find us on our website at girlsgunstrong.com. And then we're on Instagram at the girls gun strong. Yeah. And then for the certifications, you'd go to the, the academy on girlsgunstrong.com. Yeah. So and it's then we have the two certifications you can look at, mm -hmm. get on a pre-sell list. If you get on the pre-sell list, you'll save 33% and then we open up enrollment twice a year. Yeah. Amazing. Uh, when are those times? Uh, so it's generally February and September for our pre and postnatal and April and November for our women's coaching specialist certification. Mm -hmm. um, but honestly, one of the best places to go, we have a couple yeah. of closed Facebook groups that we run. So mm -hmm. if people are still on Facebook, I don't know how many people in your community still operate on there, but um, big on our community we ha really, yeah. Yeah. we've, so uh, GGS Coaching and Training Women is for current and aspiring health and fitness professionals who want to learn more about coaching women. And then Strong Women Lift Each Other Up is more like fitness enthusiast type group where women can come for support and resources and, um, you know, community and networking, things like that. And we actually staff those groups with our paid experts who created our certification. Yeah. So mm -hmm. PhDs, strength coaches, physiotherapists, Just doulas. Just free to the industry. So if you're a coach, you work with women, you have a question, you can come to GGS coaching and training women go in there. Uh, there's so many super, super talented so coaches in there, but then there's also the experts that we pay to be in there answering any question, finding, uh, sources, content, anything that you need to be able to help your clients and it's free to the industry. And it's they're amazing. tightly moderated. So like, it's a super uplifting group. You're not going to come in there and get attacked for asking a question mm -hmm. and things great. like that. Like we do. You have to, they have to ask for permission to post, right? They have okay. to. Yeah. So all of the, yep. All of the questions have yep, are have to be approved ahead of time, which we found really helpful. So, and you know, over time you see which ones are going to go well, not go well. We have certain guidelines and stuff people can follow, but they are, they're really well moderated. We have an incredible yeah, team so who does that in, to in there to sell your ML and <laughs> it's not going to work. <laughs> yeah. To sell your high ticket coaching tea, skinny detox, whatever. Yeah. Detox. It's not going to work. Um, yeah. So, so those would probably be some really good places for people. So it's GGS coaching and training women and then strong women lift each other up. And those are both on Facebook. So amazing coaches, trainer out trainers out there and just everyone in general, if you're interested in learning more about training females and pre postpartum training, please head over to girls Gus gone strong it'd be great if more people were educated and um, up to date with the most recent literature so you can convey the right message to your clients and friends and wives <laughs> etc <laughs> yeah but thank you all for having yeah. us so much like we we love what you all are doing have so much respect for you all and are excited to to be on here and connect with an you know a new audience and we just really appreciate it. yeah a lot of respect this is is this casey's first podcast my first podcast wow. yeah, you crushed it. I, usually, I usually just uh you know <laughs> stay in the back hold molly's purse <laughs> and let her do her thing no nah, man you, gotta today, told you know she's like, oh, i don't think he's i got this t-shirt on <laughs> and i'm and ready i love it i love it out on this thing so yeah thank you for having us we're excited to be here for coming all right guys over and out Huh? No, Alex. Oh, it, you sign out? That's oh. so terrible. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. Thank you guys so much for listening, for tuning in. I hope you guys enjoyed this podcast. Feel free to send us any questions that you have over on Instagram. And that's it, over Instagram only. <laughs> Don't call my phone because I'm not going to give it to you. <laughs> hope you enjoyed and catch you guys next time. Over and out. <laughs>